I think we'll start. Welcome to this panel discussion on indigenous languages, cultures, and ways of knowing, opening up opportunities with OER. Before we get into it, I just wanted to give a brief introduction to who I am and why I am here. So my name is Julianne Granley. I work with ICDE, the International Council for Open and Distance Education. Uh, we are the oldest and leading membership association for open and flexible distance education. Uh, we are turning 85 years old this year. So we've been in the business for quite a while. And we are now learning as much as we can about the intersection between OER and open education and indigenous languages, cultures, communities, and ways of knowing. Quickly, just wanted to mention that we have a conference coming up in November. You can see that also on our website, icde.org. And one coming up after that in June. You can become a member. I will leave it like that. And not to forget that uh, you might have heard me or my colleagues talk uh, that I'm also the co coordinator of the European Network of, for OER, the Encore Network. All right. So back to why we are here. Today we have a panel. We are going to have a conversation. We invite questions from you all on this topic. You know, we're asking why are we talking about this? Uh, this room, probably we all agree, but this is an important thing to talk about and to learn more about. We know we have the UNESCO OER recommendation. Some of it is outlined in there. We are obviously dealing with the SDG 4, not to mention everything in the Sustainable Development Goals. And the fact that we are currently uh, in the international decade of indigenous languages. So that is the kind of backstory, and I'm not going to dwell into any of it, rather to go in and have this conversation with the panelists. There's six people, my name is there, but I am just here to facilitate the conversation uh, with all the humility in the world. I am not an indigenous person, uh, and I do not represent anything, but I will facilitate the conversation. Uh, there will be five panelists in total. Three of them are here. Two of them are currently presenting in a different room, and they will join us when they can. Uh, Margreta Dayu Yusin is here, uh, so we will start there. And um, I will let you introduce yourself and maybe a little bit about the context of why we, you are part of this conversation today. So start with me. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, I'm Dai Yu from Taiwan. So probably some of you heard of my name story, but at the beginning, maybe it's a short-term memory for me. Um, my name is based on my father. He think I was a blossom flower on mountain hills, so that was my name in Mandarin meaning. And today, me and my colleague, Yu Xin Wang, we were introduced Taiwan indigenous culture a little bit. So I will turn the time to her right now. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Yu Xing Wang. I'm from Taiwan as well, and I'm holding a PhD. So I've done my uh, teaching for quite a long time, nearly 20 years. Uh, in the same time that Yu Xing is my Mandarin name, so I got the other's name because I'm Taiwan indigenous, indigenous people. So I got quite a lot of names. So you can see the poster got my another name is called. Danivu, and I follow my grandmother's name, Ba'u, so I got several names. And I will tell in the story to you if you have time. Now, um, okay, I just introduce myself first and will um, share my story to you. Thank you. Okay, I'm uh, Margreta Tresma. I'm uh, coming from Norway and I'm the educational manager of the Norwegian Digital Learning Arena, which is a huge repository owned by the Norwegian counties uh, that provide OER for uh, upper secondary education in Norway. Uh, so many, including myself, think if you look at the panel, you think you're looking at experts. Uh, I'm not an expert in this area of indigenous languages at all, or indigenous culture, indigenous uh, resources. Uh, 
um, but I know quite a lot about OERs. Uh, and the last few years, uh, my repository has collaborated with the northernmost counties of Norway, providing some uh, resources for the Sami uh, population in Norway, uh, especially in foreign language, uh, Sami, southern Sami, especially as a foreign language, is what we have the most resources for. So it's a foreign language because of the language uh, loss that happened during the 20th century, especially 19th, 20th century. So I can tell you a bit more about that later on. Thank you. So we have some questions lined up for the panelists, and if you want to add to them, raise your hand and we will make this an interactive conversation. We will start with the wider and more open-ended question. Um, what does opening up education with OER mean for the preservation, promotion, and sharing of indigenous languages, cultures, and knowledge systems? And I invite the panelists to share from their experience within their work uh, towards this question. And if I may start from Taiwan. Okay. <laughs> Hello again. <laughs> well, I have around seven years of doing Taiwan indigenous culture, digital cocoon. So from my experience, I was always wondering what is open meaning? Is it supposed to be a transform from into the digital world? We make the indigenous culture like a museum, just turn into like a video version, or supposed to be open in mind, truly embrace the culture and the language? Because when I was making all this curriculum, we're still using another language to transform the culture and the stories. And most of the people, even from my land, doesn't know really how many groups in our country and what is happening, the true reality they stand in front. So even for now, we are still have many things to struggle with and need to face it. So I think open and all the preservation, not just doing at the oral presentation, we still need to more action about it and truly devotion into this things because we are facing a human racist issues. Oh, that's right now, it's kind of heavy, but <laughs> I'm telling this, <laughs> what I inspect. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to add to that? Well, it's a little bit sad to talking about this, so yeah. pass. Okay, Margreta? It's a huge question. It is a huge question. <laughs> uh, and I think, the, I, I just, I can tell you a bit about the Norwegian context of OER, because uh, in Norway, education is free and education material is also free. Uh, so so the, the cost argument of open resources is not valid, actually, because for the students, it's the same, or for the pupils, it's the same, uh, who provides uh, the material. Uh, but I think that our model, where we engage teachers from the upper secondary schools to come and work with us as a form of secondment for a period of time, and they keep their pay, and they stay at their school, so when I say come and work with us, it's not physical, but they, they start working with us digitally, and we are all over Norway. Um, and, and they stay at their school, they stay in their communities, and they uh, get the same pay as they do as t for teaching, making resources. Uh, so in a situation where there is a shortage of Sami teachers and we don't want them to leave their schools, <laughs> that would be a catastrophe if they did that. So we want them to stay in their schools. Uh, this, uh, this model, we think, could be a good model for providing uh, resources in, in uh, Sami uh, subjects or Sami uh, languages. Uh, we could collaborate with the teachers in that, that way. So I think that is the strength of uh, uh, this, our model and uh, for OER, as well as all the capacity building that happens if the teachers are in charge of their own resources, are in charge of making them, sharing them with each other, and also 
putting them on our platform where they are open and free to absolutely everyone. So also adults and anyone who wants to educate themselves can access them there. Um, so I think capacity building is, is, a, is a key word here. Okay. Now, you made a reference, and I, I know that I'm not going to make the right reference here, but you started talking about open and, and how often we are related that to digital. We're digitalizing educational materials, and then you use the word museum. Yeah. Do you want to elaborate a little bit? <laughs> Well, what that means it's to you. another sad story because in Taiwan we've been colonized for several years, even for now. Transformed from different countries, Japan to KMT and to new governance mm -hmm. situation. And most of the scholars, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> there are many scholarships, anthologies, his historian, they come to observe us and make us like a sculpture or animals to be researched and put us like to a museum to be observed. So even for now, there are so many research about us, about our culture, they don't even ask about it. They just interrupt at their daily life and rip the all day platform to express themselves. And we don't really get to know them, but actual or face to face, they just interpret them and make the academics I'm sorry, I was kind of quite emotional, but most of the Taiwanese doing indigenous research make their own status based on them, but they don't give them back to the deserve. They're just using them to establish themselves. And that is a sad fact in our society right now. But compared to the other side, indigenous don't have the academic way to do that because we don't acknowledge we live in a society built by the education was from the colonizer and they dominate us. We're using the language so, and can we ask, does any of them know our language or know our mother tongue language or can they do the things we do? Can they survive in the wilderness with us together without any electricity or any water and finding food by themselves? No, they can't. <laughs> they don't even know any land or plants on our Taiwan lands, their name out there. They just need to Google it or use some app to search a leaf and find the actual name in English or in Mandarin. But they don't know the real name from our country, uh, from our indigenous community, people. indigenous way. So this kind of dilemma, they're using us to establish themselves, but Indigenous people still being oppressed right now. <laughs> Another heavy issue. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just say another sad story. My colleague was going to cry, so I probably will be getting more funny at, right now. Talk about more interesting, how they do research about us. <laughs> so, I think it's an interesting perspective because you're talking about OER or, or the resources being about yes. uh, the indigenous community rather than for. Yeah. Um, the, um, the example that, uh, or the Sami resources that are being developed in NDLA, I know are, are being created for Sami um, students. And, uh, and but, also by Sami teachers. And by Sami teachers. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned there's maybe there's a re resource gap, not only in you saying there's a capacity building element when NDLA enters and, and works with the Sami teachers to develop resources. But also there's an issue with the fact that there might not be enough teachers. Yes. Correct? Yes, that is true. And it's also um, an issue with resources uh, and where they are in the si different systems. And uh, so the Sami parliament, we have, the Sam we have a Sami parliament in Norway that deals with Sami issues. So they have the money for learning resources and the main responsibility of providing learning resources, but then you have the counties that is our employee, uh, em employees or employers, and they, um, and they have a responsibility for upper secondary pupils, so they will also have the responsibility for the Sami upper secondary pupils, uh, at least most of them. But uh, 
there are very little collaboration between these two, two bodies of different bodies of government. Uh, so uh, while the Sami parliament has the main responsibility for providing resources, they would much uh, rather prefer to, to spend their money on, on a very small and vulnerable um, Sami publishing industry. And that is really, I, I understand that completely. But it's, it's not enough. It goes too slow. Little is done and it's, everything is about capacity. Uh, there are so few people c being able to do this work. Uh, and we really uh, would like to do more, but there is, as I said, very little collaboration between the Sami parliament and the counties. So I hope that will change uh, this year. Um, in June this year, uh, Norway had its Truth and Reconciliation uh, report delivered to the Norwegian parliament, the 1st of June. And now it's uh, it's been worked on in uh, in our parliament. They are having it now and discussing it. And I am very a bit nervous, but also very excited to see what comes out of it, and what kind of advice, what kind of if there are any musts in that uh, report when it comes out of the parliament, and if that could be something about collaboration and. Um, and providing more resources, it would be great, I think. Hmm. Because it's in the report, of course, that is important, but then there is practice. Um, so we don't know quite what will happen. And just to check, these Sami uh, publishers, they are not applying open licenses to materials, are they? Sorry. Are the Sami publishers at any means open? Oh, no, they are, they are quite traditional, uh, yeah, uh, and provide mostly textbooks mm. Mm, that are in the in, in the traditional pu publishing uh, way of mm. doing things. With, yeah, mm. not open. Mm. So we're talking about the <laughs> the opportunity space, but also the challenges. Clearly, uh, with opening up education with OER. We we're talking, and we have highlighted like the words of preservation, promotion, and sharing. And sometimes maybe that doesn't feel like the the right question to ask. Um, you're talking about uh, how maybe it is more of the promotion bit that uh, it is being used uh, for. Um, do you have any uh, examples or thoughts around the sharing or even just the preservation of knowledge and languages? I think it doesn't just for cultural thing, not yeah. for language, because we use Mandarin to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a little bit shame to do that. But use Mandarin can promote the culture to everyone who know Mandarin. Mm -hmm. But for indigenous people, not really. Because when you use Mandarin to talking about the philosophy about indigenous people, that's totally different. Mm -hmm. But we try, trying to do that. Uh, for my role, I'm doing art work. I'm doing uh, all kind of creation. I teach art. So there's another language to do that. Mm -hmm. It's through the art you will know something maybe the Mandarin or the language cannot do. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's what I want to say. Not just the language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <coughs> I'm wondering at what point does it become OERs for the students themselves? Um, we are talking, you know, we hear examples of the challenges between, you know, who should be developing resources for Sami students in Norway uh, and whether it should be uh, publishers. And we've seen the keynote this morning and we're talking about public, public funds for public good. Um, and then the examples from Taiwan. Um, does it feel like the opportunities are there to, and what does that look like in Taiwan? Well, now we are doing that. We are the first indigenous, and we have the first university who had indigenous studies, so that was the first step. And we also have the first indigenous online courses 
And while we're doing that, we also give the platform to let indigenous people use their own language to explain themselves. So on my curriculum, I always use double subtitles. I don't use Mandarin just enough. I ask them to use the language to say all the things and ask them to tr try to translate by themselves, so there will be no interpretations or misunderstanding about the culture things. And also, I will ask about what they are facing right now, not just talk about the past, because more people are interested in how the traditional life is. We are living in 21st century, mm -hmm. and things change fast, even AI coming. Indigenous students can also learn in AI with cultures. So later we will share some our group work for everyone in this section. There is a AR postcard, we made it on the table. So you, everyone is free yes, to have, like yeah, and <laughs> the indigenous clothing in Taiwan also have different group and we choose four of them are more, a little bit easier for us to do in 3D way. So if you like it, and maybe later you can grab a thing from Taiwan, a little so small token for everyone. So that people can know about our Taiwan indigenous. Thank you. Thank you. The translation bit, I think it's, it's an opportunity that we, we talk about often with OER. So we have an opportunity to, to localize, translate, localize, adapt. Um, and then there's the technology bit of it. So there's AI in the, in the, in the versions of uh, ways of doing that. Uh, and I know that I have had a conversation with you, Magreta, about translations into Sami. Mm -hmm. um, and would you mind uh, telling us a little bit what you told me um, about that? Well, first of all, um, translations are, it, it's, it's, it's both good and not good because, of course, you have to uh, provide context. You have to provide the right context. So we are in the process of making a science subject in Sami, in Northern Sami, uh, and the teachers working with it. Uh, I feel like I'm always talking about the, 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 the challenges and not the good things about <laughs> this. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> okay, so it, it turned out to be mostly tran translation of the science subject that we had earlier on. So these Samis teachers translated it. And it's correct according to the curriculum for the Samis students. So it's not, it's not left out anything, but the context would, which would make it a really good a learning or good learning resources with some films, some pictures from Sami areas, good examples of Sami ways of life, and so on and so on. Uh, there was no time, there was no resources, but we are not giving up on it. So I hope uh, one day we will have that subject that way we will replace films and, and, uh, and pictures and, and make it a better uh, subject. But you were asking, I think you were talking about uh, translation uh, and language robots and yes. things like that. I think I was talking <laughs> about a robot, indeed. <laughs> well, there is a robot uh, at the, they have been working with it at the University of Tromsø for a few years, and we were kind of naive and, uh, and asked them, well, why can't we just translate everything? Uh, from Norwegian and into Northern Sami and it will go like that and of course we'll have some Sami teachers look at it afterwards that it's correct and so on and so on. But it's not good enough yet so it doesn't translate very good uh, or very well from Sami to Norwegian. It translates well between the Sami languages and there was one interesting thing that the, uh, the, the researcher at the university told me. She said I would rather have them read Norwegian uh, in school than another uh, article in bad Sami. So uh, we have to wait a bit, but now, okay, we know, we know what's happening with AI and, uh, and it, uh, the last thing we heard that it doesn't make sense in Sami yet, mm -hmm. but uh, there is every reason to think that that will move quite fast. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I have no scruples in, in making uh, resources with that kind of technology, but then again, context, context, context. We have to use humans to provide the context, right? And, and make it a good resource. It sounds like the argument is very well there for making sure that once it is in Sami and the translation models actually work pretty well between the Sami languages, 
as long as it's openly licensed, the opportunity to share that across is much higher. Yeah. Even still. Mm. Mm. Nice Johanna, Hi. do you want to join us? <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember there was two missing? <laughs> He'll show up. So this is Joanna Funk from Australia, and I'll let her introduce herself. Uh, we are, um, Thank you. and then you are in the hot seat, so. Hey. <laughs> um, yes, I'm a lecturer of cultural knowledges and teacher education at Charles Darwin University in Northern Australia on Laurakia country. Saltwater people live there. I want to acknowledge that that was and always will be Aboriginal land. Just take a minute to say that. Um, I've been doing open educational practices with Indigenous education and uh, workforce development for my PhD in 2020. And since then, I've started to work more so um, with Indigenous senior colleagues um, on research projects to in enhance and improve pathways for teacher education, um, Indigenous teacher pathways from assistant teachers into the Bachelor of Education, as well as embedding Indigenous knowledges in the higher, uh, higher education curriculum across the university. So not necessarily decolonization or indigenization, but embedding. So we started that project um, just recently. And I spent some time at Windsor University with um, some good colleagues out there because they have some interesting processes to do that. So we're doing some exchange. Thank you. And we are on the main question. So we are asking for some reflections on what opening up education using OER could mean for the preservation, promotion, and sharing of indigenous languages, cultures, and knowledge systems. And we have heard a little bit from Norway and from Taiwan. And perhaps we can also hear from Australia, straight after Gino introduces himself as the final uh, representative in this panel. We're going to go back to the slide with the names. Welcome, Gino. Thanks, Julian. Do you want to do a quick introduction? Are you? You. Oh, hi. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, sorry for being late. I literally just presented opposite. Um, yeah, my name is Gino Fransman. I'm from South Africa. Like it says there, I'm the project leader of the Open Ed Influencers, which is a student-driven advocacy project which enables skills development while they engage with open. Yeah. Gino is also a winner of the OA Global Emerging Leader Award. To be celebrated. Thank you. So, Johanna and Gino, we're asking the question what does opening up education with OER mean for preservation, promotion, and sharing of indigenous languages, cultures, and knowledge systems? So, um, I worked at a research institute at CDU for the first five years that I was there called Northern Institute. It does a lot of really beautiful public policy projects. And one of those projects that my friend was involved in was called the Living Archive of Aboriginal Languages. And it was an open resource, but it also um, did what it could before CC licenses uh, became more common in, uh, in Australia. It also um, made sure that it followed cultural permission protocols to not misuse. So there was kind of like a, um, a disclaimer and a pop-up window that said this is what this resource is for. It's now catalogued in the uh, museum and, and archives of the Northern Territory. Um, so if you look up LAAL at CDU, it might be an interesting thing. This was a project that digitized a lot of bilingual texts that were produced in schools in the Northern Territory in remote communities in, I think, 35 different languages. Um, and that was the bilingual era in the Northern Territory ended in, at the late 90s, but went on for about 20 years before that. Um, and so it preserved a lot of really beautiful children's stories um, that we then um, had 
people narrate in those languages as well. So that is kind of a, a preser preservation and a promotion of what was already public um, stories. And so it was, it was quite nice to share uh, that example because it was knowledge that and, and, and language that was done during a really rich uh, time in the education history of the Northern Territory. And to preserve an artifact of that was a really beautiful job for my colleagues. Um, we also do a Bachelor of Indigenous Languages. We have Aranda um, Bininj Gunwak and Yongamata programs at CDU that you can take online. Um, but there's also um, Yongo philosophy and language as well. So in terms of, it's not necessarily classic open, but many of our knowledge authority uh, colleagues that have been in language education and promoting bilingual education for decades, um, step forward and made sure that this was something that was available. And um, yeah, we have, we have students enrolled from all over the world. Mm. It's not a fluency program like your colleague at UBC um, Okanagan was speaking about. Um, those sound absolutely amazing. Um, I took the Yolngu Studies program um, as a, and it was recommended to anyone that was from the area who was going to work in those, in those fields to understand a little bit more about the language and culture of one group of uh, language group in the territory. And it was really, um, it rocked my Western brain. <laughs> and it was exactly the perfect lesson uh, to unsettle my ideas of what fluency, um, you know, 101 level language learning was like because it was such a complex language and it's just beautiful. Um, so I learned to not know what I didn't know. And the more I learned, the more I was fine with not knowing. And I think that was the very powerful lesson. So it wasn't I was learning a language. I was learning a, a little bit about how to engage. So I think I've said enough. Thank you. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. So yeah, thanks, Joe. And thanks for having me, everyone. Mm -hmm. So I'm from South Africa, and I'm a brown man. And I'm gay, right? So. Opening up education with OER took such a, a, a big turn for me because coming here a few days ago and Connie was there and Joe was there and I, I literally have been so caught up in the attribution that the Canadians give to the land, to their ancestors and just the gratitude that comes out, right? And it was so profound, and we were at the Indigenous People's Experience, and we went around in a circle, and we were sitting, and, and the facilitator had made a fire, right? Mm -hmm. So you know that whole thing about people sitting around a fire, and the storytelling just, it naturally happened, because people were just supposed to say, hi, um, I'm Gino, and I'm from South Africa. And even now, look at my introduction, it's going there, because it was so, impactful because then I found out that I was unable to give the same attribution because people were leading with my name is whoever and I am here and acknowledging that I am on the land that is not mine I'm a settler or if the person was indigenous like they could name things and there was a place and they were all speaking about this as in relation to their work in open. And that's what we're speaking about now, right? And then me as a South African discovered that, well, I'm from Cape Town and half of my family, well, I have no percentages here because you can see there's a lot going on. Um, but my family includes First Nation Africans who were dispossessed of that land and then also Malaysian slaves who were brought in by the Dutch East India Company and whoever else to come and build, you know? So I have Africa, I have Asia, I, have, I definitely have Europe. My grandfather was Irish. So there's a lot going on. 
And I realized that from, for me as the African bit, I was unable to say, and my people are the indigenous people of the Western Cape or of South Africa because they were kicked out and we still do not have the ability to be grateful about where we are because no one's listening. So I think open education is one route to put more of this out there without the requirement for a publication stamp which we assume is valid, um, validifying. validifying, validating. Uh, that was what I was going for. Oh, yeah, Sorry. it works. Um, validating the content and th through the content, the opinion, the perspective, the whatever. So these copyright things, it's like, oh, it just says, well done. Right? And if something's free, we still think about it as less quality. We already think that people with um, cultural differences are less quality. So open is an analogy for that as well. I think we should open up so that we can promote and we can share. So this is my story and like this is how I identify with open since being in Canada. It's been a profound experience here. And I've been doing open education for about 20 years now. And my relation to opening up is just redefined by being here. So that's, yeah, my. Thank you for sharing, Gino. It's interesting how you're sharing how your perspectives have changed mm -hmm. from learning from a different community. Yeah, and I think that that's the value of openness because otherwise Indeed. how many people read each other's actual um, outputs in publications or whatever, you know? You get six reads and you're like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you, you open up and you, you're gonna get thousands, but more than that, you're gonna get a meaningful, impactful outcome, hopefully. Hmm. Thank you. I think we'll then use that as a driver to ask the, the following question. So what can we do, right? What can governments do? institutions do, individuals do, and name the stakeholder group, if you like, uh, in order to ensure that open education, or OER, uh, or let's just keep it to open education as wide as it is, have the impact that it could have. Not for, for resources or for information to become a way of others looking in as if in a museum, as we talked about earlier, rather that it could be used as part of a museum as your example, where it is meaningful. <laughs> um, but what can we do? Well, as an institution employee, <laughs> my job is not to lead or have leadership. I was to uh, add certain uh, helper. I help the teachers, help them to guide, and I don't, I give the, how do we say that? I, I let them do what they want and I give the platform to let them say their own story and I help them to structure it. That is my role. I don't play the government way, say I tell you to go right and you go right. I say you cannot use your language. I, I totally do the opposite word. <laughs> because in curriculum courses, they will have some strict order the way students take the courses. You have to use certain ways to design, but I do it the opposite way and I pursue my <laughs> superiors say there is a reason why I do this. So I kind of rebel in my, <laughs> um, in my institution. So we are still trying to do some new experience while we're doing our courses. We even do some documentary to showing some issue and fact, um, even some humanity, um, how do we say it? Because every time I say the subject, I'm going to cry. There is a serious, I mean, no one going to say. <laughs> there is a serious issue, but no one talk about it, but still happening is the pollution issues. It happened right now still. Taiwan governor put the nuclear waste on a small island. They don't even use nuclear power electricity, but we put the waste there to a small indigenous group. They don't have even any platform or power to say they, to say no. They don't even get a vote because our government think, oh, your number is out of the way line, so you don't get a vote. You don't represent yourself to say no to the nuclear wasted. And every year, every people are dying, but no one say it. So there is 
uh, what I'm doing. I'm doing a rebellion new courses about the Dao people, and I'm trying to let them say about the, these issues about nuclear waste they on their land and have the pollution on the water every day they're selling. They're still doing the traditional hunting and go by fishing at a bowl called Dada -da but the fish they're eating have poison and have the, I'm sorry, it's too heavy, but this is why I'm doing this job because I have the way to let them to say this story and let this truth reveal to the student. Maybe someday they will become so important to change this situation in the future. And that is also, I work with Dan <laughs> Danny Wu as well, so we hope this situation might be changed in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. education can change everything. Yeah. Okay. And what you're explaining is a true and really powerful example of what education and being informed can mean for the people on the ground that are experiencing something. <laughs> I'm not having issues. <laughs> yeah, as, as my part as a teacher, so I work in the only indigenous study college in Taiwan, so there's a lot of things to do. As I say, uh, now we just use Mandarin to teach. And students, they only know Mandarin. Even they can learn something from their mother tongue, from their home, but just a few people know how to speak. Now Taiwan got 42 kinds of language, 42 kinds but uh, it's including indigenous people's language quite a lot. So we try very hard to write it down because in indig indigenous people got no writing system. So now we're just trying to make like a knowledge system to keep some knowledge in uh, by the Chinese word or the others. Now, other people, they're trying to use their language. I don't know how to say that. They use spelling system to make their language uh, survive. Mm -hmm. So now the whole knowledge system is building. But in the same time, I, I know lots of things are hard, hard to maintain, so it's a bit hard. So uh, back to my work uh, as a teacher, i just trying to do that. Thank you. Margareta? It's a bit hard to, to, to kind of say something relevant after that. <laughs> um, because, well, I'm from a very rich country and a very developed part of the world, and we have a strong welfare state, and education is free for all, and uh, everything is great in a way. But then when you look closer to the Sami situation uh, and you see the realities of their situation, you see that, the, well, uh, when push comes to shove, uh, their interests are being sacrificed uh, still. Uh, we, we have an ongoing, this is not going to develop in a competition of, of bad stories, but, but um, we have an ongoing breach of human rights uh, where the Norwegian government is supporting windmills in an area of rain, reindeer grazing uh, in the middle, middle of Norway. So it's, it's still, and the Samis are, are having uh, protests in, in our capital as we speak. Uh, and it's been going on for a year since our Supreme Court ruled it as a breach of human rights, and it's still going on, and the government won't won't end it. So, so there are a lot of things there. And then, and when I say that, I think it says something of a lack of really deep understanding, uh, of really understanding that that um, the, they can't go on like that. And why? And why is the knowledge and the wisdom of the Sami people being ignored still uh, when we know that? they are not to blame for the current uh, need of energy in this hyper 
uh, electrified and digitalized world. Um, yeah, where am I going with this, really? I don't know. I, I just wanted to say that that um, uh, there are there is a lack of understanding. It's some a lot of things that happened when I went to school. We didn't learn anything about Sami people uh, in my part of the country. Didn't learn learn a thing. And uh, and I, there was one TV show when I was a girl, uh, which made a huge impact on all of my gen generation about a little Sami boy who went to a what you call a residential school here, uh, and he didn't want to go, and he didn't understand anything, and it made a huge impact on my generation. Uh, but that was everything. And when I did my teacher's studies, uh, one of my teachers said, because there was a small part of the Norwegian curriculum, uh, I was studying to be a Norwegian teacher, that said that you should include Sami literature. And she said, this was 1996, I think, she said, I don't know why it's there. Uh, why should Norwegian students read Sami literature? Uh, she actually said that, and, and yeah. Things have moved on, now the curriculum has a lot more Sami uh, in it, and I think we are approaching understanding, but we are not there yet. Uh, so so um, uh, we can, uh, what we can do is, is kind of, we have included a lot of Sami uh, relevant material in our OER, and what I was hoping for, as I said earlier, is more collaboration to get the resources, not just about Sami issues, but the empowerment of Sami teachers to make the resources and get them out there. That is, that is actually uh, what I want to see, and I want to see collaboration uh, from the different governmental bodies, as I said earlier. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Margareta. Really briefly, um, I think as an institutional representative, and that's my wheelhouse, I can have an influence on the teaching and learning in my classes and exchange things with colleagues and be an annoying person at meetings that brings up <laughs> alternative points of view. I can um, amplify indigenous voices and languages and cultures and knowledges in my teacher education programs that I have a little bit of scope to influence, um, but also with the work I'm doing with the indigenous uh, deputy vice chancellor, Ruben Bolt is his name. Um, his approach has taught me uh, a really wonderful way to, to think about going forward and working in partnership um, in an indigenous-led, but co-designed process. That's what he wanted. And so um, that's been really helpful in engaging with a little bit more criticality at the systemic level where I, where I work. And then, of course, it always helps to have champions in executive positions mm -hmm. to put those types of infrastructures in place. And I think that institutions need to do a lot more of that. Uh, and it helps the individual efforts that we that we can make to um, proliferate a bit more. Thank you so much. Um, I think that there's existing structures, organizations, and people, and the whole concept of open is to collaborate and to to make connections, right? Mm -hmm. So that you don't have to start from the beginning. So my overarching thing is reach out, look at the people in this room, look at the people that you've gone to listen to, perhaps, um, who are all in a, an appendix on the website. Um, their work is there, the link to their slides is there, and what we do when we leave conferences is to leave the work there, and very often those connections, because we get caught up in life. So I think that opening up is gonna be an individual-led thing because we are champions who are in this room and very often we are the only people at our institutions who are pushing for this right so how are we going to advocate and win it's going to be by collaborating by making bigger groups of people with people who do this 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 and you make a product and you go back to your institution because then you are not an individual you are a group a project 
a network, and that's how you get to the governments. Governments have something called the Open Government Partnership, the OGP. If you are from a government and you don't know about OGP, get someone who is looking at OER to investigate and explore. It's such a wealth of resources there for governments to engage with open education. We don't have to do all of this ourselves, but we can make connections between people who could do something. Thank you. Yeah. We're talking, we've, we've been talking about OER or open education now from very much uh, a very broad perspective. And we've been talking about what, what the impact could be for indigenous communities themselves. But we're increasingly also talking about what that would mean for the wider understanding and the way we treat each other as human beings. Um, and collaboration and really getting to know each other and using knowledge and, and, on, and education as a tool seems to be what we are getting towards here at the end where there's so much we still don't understand uh, about each other and uh, we need to leverage that uh, opportunity space, let's call it that, uh, to get better. Um, so we are getting to the end of our time. Um, anyone that wants to say any last words or have a burning question to the panelists? Connie, thank you. Well, some of these are such important topics and as a program co-chair, we talked about the compatibility and also incompatibility of open educational resources mm -hmm. with indigenous ways of knowing and uh, the traditional knowledge labels. And then the keynote tomorrow, not to give away too much about tomorrow, but Kayla Larson will be talking about the six R's, which will be like a beautiful um, pathway to start thinking about how do we create OER alongside and with indigenous people and having them as telling what we can do to help education for all. So I just really encourage you know everyone to take good notes tomorrow during the keynote and don't come late, that's all. Because <laughs> I think you'll find some really great solutions, well, and, or not necessarily solutions, but certainly some things for you to think about because um, it's relationality that is often the key to uh, my experiences on Turtle Island, uh, walking alongside Indigenous peoples. And also, we have to start. We can't just stand and wonder, what should we do? We have to start. And also, be prepared for being humble and not knowing things. Many times in creating the program, I've learned things, and I've been humbled. And that's all part of it. So be prepared for that. That's all. Thank you so much, Connie. I very much look forward to that session and really understanding that a little bit better. Um, as I said in the very beginning, I am here very humbly saying that I don't know anything, right? Um, and I thank you all for sharing uh, your perspectives and your experiences with us. And I hope we can all go home and realize that everyone could have a, play, a role to play. And let's just be very mindful of the way we, we do that. Thank you. Thank you.